and good morning to all the participants who are joining uh, from India. My greetings to one and all present here on behalf of PIKI. Uh, it is a delight uh, uh, to welcome you. I hope that you and your families are keeping safe and healthy in these difficult times. We hope that everybody in your organizations and their families are also keeping uh, well and uh, safe and healthy, and that your country is really uh, building a roadmap uh, towards back to business, and which is the uh, title for this uh, virtual conference, Roadmap Towards Back to Business for Asia-Pacific uh, Countries. Um, it is probably the first uh, time uh, of its virtual conference bringing together leaders of the Asia-Pacific regions. On behalf of uh, FIKI, I welcome you all to this first FIKI uh, CASI virtual conference. May I extend a very Special welcome to Mr. Sameer Modi, President uh, Cassie, for his special interaction. Uh, Mr. Modi, hope you and your family are safe and healthy, and thank you for joining us here and look forward to your special address a bit later today. Thank I, you, would like, I would like to extend my warm welcome and greetings to everybody. For me, uh, our meeting in Dhaka is still very, very fresh, uh, and where I had met uh, many of you uh, who are on the panel today. So, Ambassador Mohammed Abdul Hanan, uh, Ambassador Benedicto Yujishio, Mr. Jamal Inayin Shilvili, uh, Mr. Gurjur, Mr. Brian Clark, uh, Manjula De Silva, and Chikara uh, Shimuzu. So thank you all for joining us for this exclusive interaction. They will be sharing your respective country experiences on the impact of COVID, what governments are doing, and how can Asia Pacific rejoin uh, uh, and this region jointly mitigates impact in both in terms of health and economic. Just this morning, uh, the Prime Minister addressing Indian industry talked about how India had actually helped 125 countries around the world with uh, supplies of health equipment, pharmaceuticals, and other uh, facilities, and included a lot of Asian, Asia Pacific countries. Uh, India and uh, India has also taken some measures uh, actually uh, to uh, contain the uh, spread of uh, COVID and also uh, limit the impact on the economy. Uh, till date, we've had about nearly 200,000 infections, about 1.9, uh, 1, uh, you know, 198,706 confirmed cases with uh, 55,598 uh, 5, deaths. On the brighter side, we have seen a fairly rec a good recovery ratio, and 95,527 people have recovered from COVID, and our deaths per million stand currently at 3.21 uh, per million uh, amongst the lowest in the world. In the economic front, some of the major sectors of the Indian economy facing the heat were uh, tourism and aviation because these sectors were completely closed. It's only from the 8th of June that we are starting hotels. Okay. And uh, with international and uh, domestic travel closed, uh, only domestic travel has started very recently on the 25th. The Indian Association of Tour Operators estimate a loss of about 1.13 billion in the hotel, aviation, and tourism sector. In the media and entertainment sector, advertising expenditure on television is expected to decline by about 50 to 55% in, in the first quarter of April, June, FY 2021. Retail, according to the Confederation of All India Traders, the country's retail sector has also had about a $30 billion loss uh, here. Non-grocery and food retailers are reporting uh, 80 to 100% reduction in sales during the lockdown, but now we expect that it will really uh, go up. In fact, the consumer durables uh, is another sector hit, and since India is importing uh, nearly 70% of the components and uh, for consumer durable products, it's also got an impact on the trade in the Asia-Pacific uh, region. The uh, government has taken a lot of monetary and fiscal measures, including monitoring on repayment of loans, infusing liquidity for NBFCs and uh, microfinance institutions, uh, uh, looking at relief uh, for borrowers by reduction in repo rates, uh, special uh, packages for the uh, medium and small industry. Just yesterday, the government redefined the uh, definition in terms of the amount of investment and turnover for MSMEs, and uh, a whole lot of in, uh, whole lot of support measures for people at the bottom of the pyramid and migrant workers were actually uh, announced and implemented. 
the numbers are actually staggering. Uh, you know, uh, there um, so 530 million uh, uh, you know uh, gas cylinders have been actually uh, given out in this point of time, just as one uh, indicator. If we look at uh, the economic package, uh, it is uh, declared under the vision of Atma Nirbhar Bharat, which means self-reliant uh, India. Uh, it is slightly different from self-dependent. Uh, it is uh, uh, approximately amounting to uh, 277 uh, billion uh, dollars. Um, it accounts for roughly about 10.3 percent of India's GDP. Uh, not only will it have short and medium uh, term impacts, but a lot of significant reforms have been done in agriculture, in coal mining, minerals, atomic energy, uh, space, uh, power uh, sector, uh, among others. There have also some reforms be done in the health sector. Piki has been in the forefront uh, of the entire uh, uh, effort of supporting government's endeavor to revive the economy and health industry, especially the MSMEs. We have developed a robust COVID response strategy uh, encapsulating demand, supply, and innovation and asset building. Piki has been helping members on the ground in terms of movement of people, movement of goods, restarting of industries. Piki has actually brought out a whole, with WHO, a kind of a package for restarting industry. I will request Gajinder to actually share it with all the members of TASI because it might uh, form a useful document for you. As far as global trade is concerned, it's expected to fall between 13 to 32% in 2020. Uh, there are various predictions of various regions, but since we have all of you on this panel, uh, we would like to hear how it has impacted and how we can all work together to revive trade and uh, uh, you know, international cooperation. I think the, the interesting part is that there were certain policies, certain strategies, certain philosophies of international cooperation and trade before COVID. Now, post-COVID, in some areas, there's going to be extremely closer cooperation, whether it be healthcare or whether it be other uh, sectors. And you know, together, we'll have to shape the future of the geoeconomic landscape in the Asia Pacific. We believe that the approach to tackle this situation could be in four pillars, build confidence in trade and global markets by improving transparency, keep global supply chains going, especially for essentials, avoid making things worse, and look beyond the, uh, the immediate. With these uh, initial remarks, I would like to end here and look forward to hearing the fellow panelists and would be happy to take any questions in the Q&A session. Once again, uh, welcome and hope you have an enriching session with us. We have actually uh, now over 119 participants in this uh, webinar. And let me now take this opportunity to hand over to Mr. Samir Modi, President Kasi, for his very special address. Mr. Samur, uh, Samir Modi, please. Thank you, uh, Dilip, uh, for your insightful comments. Good day to everyone. I'd like to welcome all panelists and participants for today's virtual conference on roadmap toward back to business for Asia Pacific countries, joint, uh, jointly organized by Kasi and Siki. This is the first virtual conference that is being held by Kasi, and we are very grateful to Fiki for initiating this milestone event for us. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is having a massive impact, not only on our daily lives, but also on our businesses. None of us could have foreseen the extraordinary circumstances brought on by the health crisis, and all of us are asking how long it will last and how soon will it bounce back. The pandemic continues to trigger economic and social shocks broadly, sparing no nation from devastating multidimensional impacts, further accelerating existing vulnerabilities and inequalities, leading to immense suffering in regions around the world. A recent report by the ADP assessing the potential impact of COVID notes that the global eco economic uh, impact of COVID-19 could reach $5.8 trillion under a three-month containment and $8.8 .8 million under a six-month containment scenario. The potential economic impact on Asia is estimated at $1.7 trillion and, and three million containment and, uh, and a $2.5 trillion under a six-month containment scenario, with the region accounting for 30% of the overall decline in global output. Under short and long containment scenarios, the ADB reports 
note that border closures, restrictions in trade, lockdowns that outbreak affected economies, economies implemented to arrest the spread of COVID-19 will likely cut global trade by 1.7 trillion to 2.6 trillion dollars. Global em employment decline will be between 158 to 242 million jobs, with Asia Pacific compromising 70% of the total employment losses. The labor income around the world will decline by 1.2 trillion to 1.8 trillion, 30% of which will be felt by economies in the region, or between 3.59 and 550 billion dollars. The ADB also reported and pointed out that governments around the world have been quick in responding to the impacts of the pandemic, implementing measures such as fiscal and monetary easing, increased health spending, and direct support to cover losses in economies and revenues. According to ADB estimates, sustained efforts from governments focused on these measures could soften COVID-19 economic impact by as much as 30 to 40 percent. This could reduce global economic losses due to the pandemic to between 4.1 trillion and 5.4 trillion. These findings highlight the important role policy intervention can play to help mitigate damage to economies. They also provide governments with a relevant policy guide as they develop and implement measures to contain and suppress the pandemic and lessen its impact on the economies and people. In this regard, I'm pleased to note that many of ACASI members are reportedly working with their respective governments in implementing stimulus packages to help confront the economic challenges posed by the COVID-19 situation. At the same time, they're also instituting measures aimed at minimizing the negative impact of the pandemic on the business operation of the respective constituencies. With the economic fallout from the global spread of COVID-19 expected to continue, increasing Kasi and Siki had therefore agreed to organize today's virtual conference, have invited representatives from selected Kasi member chambers, including those from Japan, the Philippines, Australia, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Georgia, Bangladesh, and India. The panelists will share information and insights the expected impact on the, of the health crisis on the respective economies, what the business sector and government authorities in the countries are doing to mitigate the impact of the crisis on the economy and to safeguard business operations, what measures are currently being set in place as part of efforts to put back the economy and businesses on the road to recovery, the challenges and opportunities that the market face at the present time and what businesses have learned from the situation. In closing, let me take this opportunity to thank all our panelists and moderator who have graciously accepted our invitation for them to share with us their experiences and insights on the issues surrounding the theme of today's virtual conference. I'm sure the insightful inputs will contribute great value for today's discussion. I would also like to express once again my deep gratitude to the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce Industry for a strong support of CASI and its activities. It is our ardent hope that the level of quality of such support not only will it be maintained, but will increase in the coming years. Now I'd like to hand over the floor to our moderator, Ambassador Mohammed Abdul Hanan. Ambassador Hanan is currently advisor to the Federation of Bangladesh Chambers of Commerce and Industry, as well as advisor to the United Nations Secretary General Central Emergency Response Fund Advisory. He also served as a consultant to the World Intellectual Property Organization. In, the, in ending, I would like to wish you all to stay safe, and your family to safe, safe and healthy. And Ambassador Hanan, please, the floor is yours. You? You hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, very good afternoon to all of you from Bangladesh. So, uh, uh, I, I'm truly delighted that uh, all of you have fresh memories on Bangladesh. And uh, although it is a very difficult situation, but we are meeting virtually, this is also very, very urgent and very important. Uh, I'm indeed very happy to be with you and uh, feel very privileged to be moderator of such an important discussion uh, with a stellar of panelists and distinguished audience. Dear audience, I'm positive you all will agree with me that the core elements of the welcome address and the keynote speech have set the tone of our interactive discussion in line with the theme of the conference. 
COVID-19 pandemic is a harsh reality. The world now experiences an unprecedented global health crisis, exposing its vulnerability, and which impacted the global economy virtually to a grinding halt. We have caringly listened to the keynote address and that afforded us exposure to lots of interesting perspectives. I believe you all will agree with me that the key issue emerged for special attention is a double whammy situation, whether life and livelihood should go together or otherwise. Definitely, our theme today suggests us to reflect frankly towards having a stimulating discussion which might help comprehend the complexities in articulating a possible roadmap for back to business. Accordingly, I have the time constraints. Given the time constraints, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelist, Ambassador Benedicto Ihoiko, the President of Philippine Chambers, Mr. Jamal Inaishville, former President of Georgian Chamber, Mr. Brian Clark, Director of Australian Chambers, Mr. Sergi Gurgur, the Chief Advisor of President of Turkish Union of Chambers, Mr. Munzula De Silva, CEO of Sri Lankan Chamber, and Mr. Uh, Shikara Shimuju, Deputy General Manager, Japan Chamber. Before we start, I would like to give a gentle reminder to our panelists that they have only five minutes each for their reflections on the theme of the conference on their respective country perspective. And then I will have a few interventions to the panelists. Finally, I will have a Q&A segment uh, with the audience. Without much ado, let me welcome to our distinguished panelist, Ambassador Yuhiko, first president of CSCCI to start with. Ambassador, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador Anand. Uh, to, my, uh, to the distinguished guests, to my friends from Kasi, my friends in Fiki, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, forgive me for not mentioning the individual personalities, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to go and uh, share with you our experiences in the Philippines and uh, what we are doing and what we are looking forward to. The Philippine economy was actually doing very, very well at the end of 2019. Uh, Philippines was the second fastest growing economy in Asia, growing at the rate of over 6%. We have very good employment figures. Uh, our income, average income was high. Uh, poverty level is down. And so everything was uh, looking even better in uh, 2020. But, uh, well, you all know what happened, the pandemic hit. Oh, it's like a car traveling at 80 miles per hour and the brakes hit and uh, everything stopped. All businesses closed, basically, except essential businesses, food, medicine, and other necessities. Uh, we, the businesses had to try to keep their employment at uh, normal levels, but they couldn't. So after six weeks, uh, businesses had to actually advance uh, the bonuses, advance money to our employees. But when it became obvious that this is going to be lasting for a long time and not sustainable, government stepped in and actually started social amelioration programs and, and so on and so forth. Uh, as you you know, uh, we had a giant BPO, business process outsourcing industry here in the Philippines uh, with millions of employees. We also have a lot of overseas foreign workers uh, deployed in all over the, all over the world. And uh, all of this actually were a source, major source of dollar earnings for the Philippines and basically slow down to a trickle. So. Uh, this is what it is, you know, and uh, we, we cannot do anything about it. As the Chief Justice of the United States said, 
during the, the his son's high school graduation ceremony, he mentioned, he said that, well, this uh, pandemic just reminds us that we cannot control the world. In any case, uh, we in the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry uh, several weeks ago actually worked with government, the Department of Finance, the Department of Trade, the National Economic and Development Authority, by developing a roadmap to recovery. We are trying to think about, okay, what are the things that we can do going forward in order to, first of all, help our poorest of the poor, help our employees, make sure that when we are able to reopen our businesses, that they will have still some money to or to working capital to be able to be able to open their businesses. Uh, insofar as uh, the Philippine commercial, oh, sorry, Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry is concerned, I personally, as president of this organization, had to talk to the Bankers Association of the Philippines. I had to tell them, hey guys, look, you have to please help our SMEs, which comprise 70% of our economy. And you can help them by uh, restructuring the loans maturi maturing from March 16 this year to December 31 of uh, this year. Move the maturities one year back. And of course, the banker said, hey, you know what? What about our maturities? We need cash flow too. So my next trip was to the Banco Central of the Filipinas. This is our central bank. I was telling the governor of the central bank, please help out. Please buy the SME loans and allow the banks to rediscount this. So in fact, if we push back the maturities, uh, they'll be able to have some cash. So which, which uh, basically happened. There were... Uh, also, other things that we did, we participated very much in the government funding of stimulus programs, which are now starting to be implemented. And uh, basically, the chamber was a partner of the Philippine government in terms of trying to sustain our economy, restart our economy, and provide for employment and help the country. So that's the function of uh, Philippine Chamber. In fact, I was jokingly saying to my colleagues in the Philippine Chamber, hey, when you conscripted me to be president of the PCCI, this was not in the job description. Uh, to be president during the time of COVID was uh, not in the job description, but nevertheless, I cannot do anything. I'm president now. So we are going to help as much as we can. now. The key challenges going forward are basically restarting our economy safely. You know, it's not a matter of a switch where we turned it off and now we will turn it back on. That's not going to happen. Restaurants here have to obey uh, safe dis social distancing procedures. So that means basically if they reopen, they will reopen at 50% capacity. And 50% capacity actually uh, even before they start, they know they have to, they will lose money, but they have to. Ambassador, you okay. So I, I'm just going to close by saying that uh, we are now in the process of trying to restart the economy because uh, that is what will keep our country alive and that is how we can sustain employment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, for your interesting experience and uh, also. Uh, uh, your, uh, you know, uh, the overall reflections uh, on the Philippine economy and how the, how you do it, you know. And uh, we are very happy seeing that uh, chamber and government uh, forced the partnership, and that is most important, I believe. This also happened in Bangladesh. But anyway, let me proceed to uh, uh, invite Mr. Uh, Jamal uh, Inayashvi, uh, the immediate past president of CSCCI, to kindly take the floor. Uh, Mr. Jamal, you have the floor. Good afternoon and good morning to everybody. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Piki and Cassie for uh, organizing uh, <clears throat> this webinar in very short period of the time. So, 
of course, it's very important for all of us to 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 uh, share with our uh, experiences and uh, <clears throat> exchange the ideas. What we have to do in this very difficult uh, situation for the whole world. So the Georgia has uh, been uh, uh, quite successful. The fight against uh, COVID spreading. We are not a big country. We are a country of population of 3.5 million. Uh, and uh, uh, as of today, we have uh, 794 cases. And uh, unfortunately, only uh, 12 uh, people died uh, from uh, COVID disease. So if you compare with uh, uh, our uh, neighbors like Armenia or Azerbaijan, so we are uh, <clears throat> uh, very successful. And of course, uh, uh, all this has been achieved uh, due to the almost complete stop of the business activities uh, in the country. Uh, today, uh, uh, we start uh, reopening our economy, and uh, uh, from, from today, actually, the, all, all uh, restaurants and bars and cafes are open again. The hotels are still closed, uh, and we are expecting that from the July 1st, uh, we'll start receiving uh, even the visitors uh, to Georgia. So we will open the country uh, from the completely from the 1st of July. But uh, the negative impact on the economy will be huge. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, I can tell you even from my businesses, uh, uh, so uh, we have, uh, I'm involved in transport and logistics, so we have drop of uh, the volumes by 50%, which is, which is, of course, huge. So our country is very much depends on the, the tourists, uh, we used to uh, receive every year uh, more than 8 million visitors. Uh, so, and uh, of course, this year uh, and will be the next year will be the, the most difficult years for, 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 for our economies. And of course, uh, the government takes all necessary uh, measures and steps to help the citizens and the businesses. Uh, but. Uh, from the other hand, uh, I think we should uh, learn how to live with uh, this uh, reality with COVID. We have to adapt our businesses and uh, to, to learn how to work in this situation. So um, <clears throat> uh, we uh, think and believe that uh, uh, this year will be very hard year for our country and the economy and uh, probably the from the next year, we'll start picking up again. But also very much depends not on the Georgia situation in Georgia, but in our neighboring countries, in the countries uh, from where we have uh, most of the visitors, and of course uh, in the countries uh, uh, from uh, with whom we have our uh, strong uh, trade uh, partnership. So uh, we are not uh, alone in these problems. So we are all together. So and we have to uh, find a way how to survive, how to live, uh, and uh, uh, actually we believe uh, that uh, <clears throat> we will we'll be able to, to, to handle this situation and to become even stronger so in the future. So we have to keep our, we have to be optimistic. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, sir, for, for uh, helping us to get a few minutes, you know, more, a couple of minutes more from you. And uh, we are great to relieved that uh, you are in control of the COVID uh, health crisis, you know, and uh, certainly in the economic front, there is a huge difficulty. But anyway, we are, we are, I believe that your reflection is very useful. And uh, now I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Brian Clark uh, to speak. Brian, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Ambassador. Um, look, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today um, as well. And um, it's important that uh, Cassie uh, tries to use this technology to, to get across the work of Cassie and what we're all doing. Um, so, you know, I, I welcome the initiative as well from, from Cassie. Um, from an Australian perspective, um, 
much as we've heard from the other speakers so far, last year we were doing quite well. Um, the Australian government had reached a point where this budget, which would have been in May, um, was going to be the first surplus uh, budget for some time. Um, Australia had had a 29 year run of uh, uninterrupted run of economic growth, um, was in some respects the envy of the world from that perspective. And then we had very serious bushfires on the um, eastern coast of Australia through the summer. Um, they were quite devastating to some of the communities involved. Um, and so that of itself um, interrupted the economic performance of certainly New South Wales and Victoria as states. And they were just getting back on their feet and, and looking for recovery because the bushfires themselves had then curtailed a lot of the tourism activities. Um, and a lot of the communities there were devastated uh, and a lot of construction required. And then we had the coronavirus um, pandemic. Um, our borders were closed, not only internationally, but within states. And so uh, there was quite a lot of um, uh, closure of businesses. Those that were, were that were able to were encouraged to continue working from home. And so many people were able to do that. We were fortunate in having sufficient technology to do it. But in remote areas of Australia, that's still quite a difficult challenge. Um, and, and so not everybody has been able to uh, um, maintain their businesses as they would have hoped. The government's implemented a number of stimulus measures and uh, particularly aimed at retaining employees or the relationship between employees and employers so that instead of people becoming unemployed and then having to be re-employed later, those bonds are maintained in the hope that the business can um, restart um, at some point in time and those employees will return to where they were. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that our borders remain closed, our international borders. Our state borders are now reopening, our businesses are restarting. Um, we've got um, um, ver various levels which are, which are being impacted, but our international border will remain closed. So we're working with the, um, through the Australian Chamber with the New Zealand uh, Chambers on trying to get that restart opened as soon as we can because New Zealand is also uh, largely now coronavirus free, as is Australia. Um, we were very fortunate from that perspective. We had seven, around 7,500 cases, um, around 6,900 of those have re recovered, um, just over 100 of people have died, and so there's only less than 500 live cases um, in, in Australia. But of course, we can't open the borders because of the risk of exposure. And so we're looking at how we could do that with New Zealand and we've created a model which we've put to the Australian government of how to open Canberra to Wellington rather than nations is well, where are the safe spots to go within countries. So both Canberra and Wellington are coronavirus free and have been for more than a month each. They have good testing regimes, they have good health facilities. And so we've suggested to the government that we could do, we could reopen there as a test test bed and on the basis of success then we can use that model to to reopen um, certainly other routes with New Zealand but also potentially look at other locations around the world um, who have similar characteristics there's a number of Pacific Island nations who also have either very low or no cases um, and and as some of you have expressed it's under control in a number of nations so we don't want to see a situation where ultimately in Australia 25 million people uh, hostage to only a very few cases and then the risk of how do we reopen. So this has become our major challenge. Through the Australian Chamber we're working with the government and proposing ideas um, through a number of their task forces but we're looking at the recovery phase now. The economy is likely to take around a six percent um, decline um, from its previous growth uh, forecast. We were traveling at around um, just under 2% um, growth rate usually um, for Australia. And our issue now is the question of where does the return come from? So there's been some speculation around, I saw The Economist had a series of articles on the 90% of economy. So that is that even if economies can fully recover domestically, without their international engagement, they're still somewhat deficient. 
And so this is remaining a challenge and, and we want to see this open up. Australia has also been very dependent on China. Many nations are as well. And so there's a fairly live conversation about diversity in markets. And again, I think this is a real strength where Cassie can play in highlighting what are the other opportunities in other nations um, rather than necessarily being fully dependent on, on one nation or dominant uh, with one nation or another one. So I'll leave it there and uh, welcome any questions. Thank you, Brian, for your uh, kind reflections. And uh, I fully agree with you that the, every country like Australia is internationally exposed for international trade. And this is the key area that created millions of jobs even in Bangladesh. So um, let me uh, now welcome uh, Mr. Uh, Gugur uh, from Turkey to kind of speak. Mr. Gugur, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I greet everyone with respect. Please accept my special thanks to Katsi and FISI, which organizes this important and timely conference to support our business world. And there is still extreme uncertainty around the world about the strength of the recovery. The most important question is how long it takes to contain the outbreak in 2020 and whether there is a second outbreak in next year. Regarding the Turkish economy, before this outbreak, our economy was expected to grow 5% in this year. And indeed, in the first quarter, our GDP grew by 4.5% year-on-year basis. This is one of the fastest expansion rates among its, our peers for the first quarter. However, in the second and third quarter, we are feeling the effects of the pandemic. Turkish economy will shrink in the second and third quarters like many other countries. Uh, while weaker tourism revenues and export demand are among the main problems, lower oil prices may relieve our country's economy, but especially exports and tourism are expected to be particularly hit. Our central bank and the government had introduced successive support packages to limit the fallout caused by the virus. Uh, while, while summer will be a, a bit slow, we predict a recovery in the final four months of the year. As part of the backing for the real sector and individual customers, especially the public, uh, Turkish public banks, uh, cost-effective loans and grace credit applications continue as well. Uh, after the virus is completely under control, the recovery on our bank balance sheets will be rapid. Uh, the realization of deferred investment demands and an environment of abundant liquidity provides a positive outlook for Turkish the rapid loan growth. In short, Turkish corporate sector and banks appear to be sufficiently prepared financially and technically to handle the unexpected pandemic and its aftermath. We expect a recovery period in the last quarter of this year. Major lenders, including the private banks, have completed refinancing rounds worth billions of dollars. There have been no major corporate defaults in Turkey. The lira, our currency, has steadied. Interest rates are falling. This epidemic also showed the world that the drawbacks of the supply chain being connected to a single geography. Developed economies such as the US and the Europe are in search for alternative supply centers. They want to reduce dependence on single market looking for resource diversity. And Turkish high production capacity, strong human resources, rapid delivery performance, and dynamic entrepreneurial structure. With all these advantages, Turkish, Turkey can strengthen uh, its position as a global supply point. We believe Turkey can use this as an advantage and can increase its share in European markets after 2021. Therefore, our economy uh, will bounce back, we hope, back at the end of this year, and we will see positive growth at the end of this year, and Turkey will end 2020 with positive economic growth. Also, many international reports also expect Turkey to recover rapidly in the next year, 2021, with a GDP growth of 6%. Therefore, hopefully, if there is no second wave, we are in a cautious optimism. Thank you for letting us share our views. Fine. So I, I, I fully uh, agree with the speaker that uh, the supply chain disruption and the demand side unpredictability 
and instability is is definitely the crucial element you know among other issues you know so uh, let me let me proceed to the next speaker uh, to uh, mr manjula de silva to speak to mr de silva you have to... uh, yes uh, thank you ambassador and uh, good afternoon and greetings uh, from sri lanka uh, i will speak on the impact of uh, covid-19 on the sri lankan economy uh, before that uh, if i may start with the health perspective uh, we have had about uh, 1600 cases uh, of whom uh, half have uh, now recovered and have been discharged uh, so there's about uh, 800 uh, remaining in hospitals and one area where we have had uh, a lot of success is uh, in the containment of deaths to just 11, uh, so which is uh, just uh, less than 1% of the total number affected. Uh, but despite the success on managing the health front, uh, there's been a severe impact on the economic front. And uh, so we are expecting this year uh, the economy to go through a serious uh, slowdown. Uh, in fact, uh, the IMF is uh, estimating that the economy uh, will go into a uh, period of negative growth. So they are predicting minus 0.5, uh, whereas, of course, our central bank is uh, estimating a positive growth of 1.5%, which is still below uh, what we experienced uh, last year. Uh, but uh, everybody is expecting some form of a recovery in 2021. So. IMF uh, forecasts a growth rate of 4.2% for 2021, and Central Bank also estimates 4.5. So there isn't a lot in between those two. But if you look at the uh, impact, uh, the adverse impact uh, of the COVID uh, uh, crisis, uh, you can see this has come from many different fronts. Uh, so on one hand, the domestic uh, containment measures uh, with the lockdowns and the curfews imposed have had a, a significant impact uh, on the smooth running of businesses. Uh, then in addition to that, uh, we have also suffered with the economic slowdown in our key trading partners, uh, particularly uh, US and the EU, uh, who are our principal buyers for uh, apparel uh, exports. So we are uh, seriously affected on that front. Uh, then also the remittances uh, that bring, bring in a lot of foreign exchange uh, have also seen a sharp uh, decline. Uh, so that is uh, yet another factor. And of course, the tourist arrivals have come to a virtual zero uh, since uh, the airport has been closed. So during the months of April and May, there haven't been a single uh, tourist arrival at all. Uh, so which is uh, severely impacting on our economy, which is heavily dependent on uh, tourism. So if you look at uh, some of the actions that have been taken to mitigate uh, the COVID impact, uh, the government uh, moved in very fast uh, by introducing a lockdown and a curfew. There was a lot done on awareness creation and then people were encouraged to work from home. Uh, at the same time, uh, the agriculture sector was uh, permitted to carry on with their operations because uh, that was seen as a low risk area and the manufacturing of uh, essential items, uh, uh, including food, was also allowed to be continued uh, with uh, uh, significant uh, safeguards and measures to uh, ensure uh, sanitary uh, uh, excellence. And then at the same time, uh, the distribution of food and essential items uh, was carried out mostly online. Uh, so these are uh, things that uh, people began to experience a lot more than during the pre-COVID era. And the port operations were continued, as well as other essential services, as, uh, such as uh, banks and insurance, uh, that continued even during the curfew and the lockdown period, but subject to a lot of uh, guidelines on the health and sanitation aspects. Uh, so as far as the uh, government is concerned, they also came up with several measures. The central bank introduced several measures to uh, bring in some liquidity into the economy by cutting down policy rates, uh, statutory reserve rates, etc. Uh, there was a debt uh, moratorium introduced for uh, SMEs as well as the self-employed people. 
and a, a special refinance facility was introduced uh, to provide the soft loans uh, for working capital needs of uh, primarily the SME. So that was very helpful. And uh, cash grants were given uh, targeting the vulnerable sections uh, of the population, the low income earners and uh, the self-employed people who uh, basically lost their livelihood uh, during the curfew and the lockdown. Uh, so these are some of the measures the government took and the Ceylon Chamber has also been in the forefront uh, providing a lot of recommendations uh, to the government for consideration. And uh, so we focused on uh, actually three types of measures, immediate measures, medium term measures and long so I will I will share a presentation which give you more details on some of the measures that we have uh, proposed to the government and uh, uh, quite a few of them have already been implemented and some we are uh, expecting uh, will be taken uh, note of in the near future. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, that is just to give you a snapshot view of uh, what's happening in Sri Lanka. Over to you. Thank you, Mr. Silva. Excellent. Well, uh, uh, Sri Lanka has been considered one of the success story to to manage the COVID uh, health uh, crisis. Uh, but for the economic front, I think Bangladesh and other countries are similar uh, with you situation because uh, the government's dependent economy, millions of jobs are under threat. There's a job loss, and export is dwindled in Bangladesh. You know, like others. So the situation is really very as a grim. So let me proceed to now uh, to Mr. Uh, uh, Shimiji uh, from Japan uh, to kindly share his views. Mr. Uh, Shimiju? Yes. The floor, sir. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Uh, thank okay. you very much, Ambassador. Uh, could you hear me? No? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. You. Very well. Very well. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you very much, Ambassador. I'm honored to have this valuable opportunity today. Uh, now I'm going to make a brief initial remark. Uh, first of all, in Japan, a total of 16,697 people was infected and 900 were killed by May 31st, oh no, no, no uh, yesterday. And since the first case was confirmed on January 15th, the average number of new infections per day during the latest seven days is about 45 people. In the government's monthly economic report, uh, which went public last week, uh, it showed that the Japanese economy is worsening rapidly in an extremely severe situation due to the novel uh, coronavirus. Under such circumstances, the government lifted the state of emergency that had been in place all over the nation one week ago. And it's now gradually moving to the state of the resumption of economic activities. Although, depending on the employment situation, the economic downturn may last for a long time. But for now, it's expected uh, the economy will pick up mainly due to personal consumption. Following the spread of the new coronavirus, the Japanese government is trying to seed its economy with enormous stimulus package. Currently, uh, emergency economic measures, including cash benefits and uh, interest-free loans uh, being implemented and mobilizing all policy measures in such fields as finance, banking, and taxation. Companies are adopting uh, staggered hours, teleworking, uh, temporary leave, and cautious about social distancing. Even after the state of emergency was lifted, we have to start businesses that respond to the new normal. On top of that, we would have to prepare 
for a long battle to reach the normalcy while preventing the spread of the new infections. In response to the current situation, uh, Japan Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Tokyo Chamber of Commerce and Industry are petitioning various requests to the government, uh, including quick supply of funds to businesses in need and the IT utilization support for SMEs. As a, mat mat uh, as a matter of course, it's not possible to promote international businesses in one nation. So we can exercise wisdom and cooperate together. Each chamber of commerce and industry and confederation like CASI are the hubs of wisdom, cooperation, and action. The noble coronavirus has forced economic activity to be severely constrained on a global scale. But no, not all things have stopped in the world. What kind of changes are occurring in the world, regions, or each nation? What kind of impact it has on the economy and the businesses? Uh, we can bring in information, exchange opinions, and disseminate thoughts and ideas. Then we can uh, contribute to promote international business and economic growth in this region. This is not a specific example, but in the present circumstances, online shopping and uh, telecommuting are becoming more prevalent. Uh, business people must accurately grasp such changes in society and examine the possibility of new business development. Uh, recently, uh, I've been renewed with strong belief, uh, strong thought, uh, the fact that telework is surprisingly uh, useful. Uh, perhaps many companies that have introduced telework have noticed that uh, the range of work can be expanded the way forward. Of course, there is some limitations, but I expect it will lead to a review of the current work and the movement of IT utilization represented by telework may progress at once, at once even uh, among MSMEs. Uh, lastly, uh, also to start easing entry restrictions to Japan will be a major issue for the future. Uh, foreign visitors to Japan have decreased sharply, which is having a severe impact on restaurants hotels and outdoor leisure industries. So we must consider the recovery of such industries. Uh, this is my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shimozu, for your uh, reflections on the overall uh, Japanese situation. And uh, well, uh, uh, I, I pick up one element from you that uh, you suggested for uh, cooperation in action through CSCI and also to promote international businesses growth in the region and not to be dependent on on one nation and this one nation issue is a buzzing word globally moving around so uh, uh we have had just uh, our distinguished panelists the six uh, we we are truly enriched with a wide spectrum of perspectives um, on the theme of the conference before i open the floor for q and a let me have a few quick interventions uh, with our distinguished panelists. Uh, my first question uh, is to Mr. Ambassador Uihiko to kindly reflect on uh, the, the issue like uh, the global buzzword again uh, uh, has been the 21st century is the Asian century. Do you think it is still valid? how the emerging tendency of so-called independence and sovereignty be reconciled with the multilateral trading system for free trade for global common good. Ambassador Yuhiko. Well, uh, there is in fact a book, uh, the Pacific Century, um, referring to our ASEAN countries or the Pacific, uh, in fact, uh, four years ago, I remember I gave a speech in 
in I think uh, Taiwan uh, during an anniversary of CASI, where I said that the center of economic gravity of the world is now moving towards the east, towards our area. So may I may I request Brian uh, for your kind of reflections on the point I raised? Ah, so to the latter part of your question around um, the sovereign approaches, it's been very disappointing to see nations, um, of course they've quite rightly uh, closed their borders for health reasons, but to then uh, also offer coupling of restraint of trade um, as some nations have done, uh, that was very disappointing and we are seeing that opening up. Um, correspondingly though, we're also seeing a number of nations uh, embracing digital technology. So the process of border crossings, for example, um, has allowed levels of digitization that has not been acceptable in the past. So these are things that we'd like to see um, continue and improve. The WTO of itself, um, you know, has had some challenges uh, of late. We, um, you know, the last Doha round, um, you know, was aimed at the improvement and embrace of the developing world and yet uh, failed to reach a conclusion, which was disappointing. And now we've seen nations uh, threaten to move away from or disrespect the uh, multilateral system, including the um, dispute mechanism. So um, to all of these things are not not boding well for a system. We have uh, Roberto Azevedo, the Director General, um, retiring early. Um, perhaps there will be a circuit breaker associated with that. Um, Australia and Singapore and Japan and others have been working uh, very hard to maintain the system and to offer alternates. So we hope that will be fruitful. To your earlier question on the Asian century though, is I believe it's possibly even stronger than it was before. Um, you know, I, I think that um, the North Northern Hemisphere superpowers may be losing their strength. And I've recently written a paper which was entitled, um, you know, Australia is a 21st century superpower. Now, when you have a look at it, in the Southern Hemisphere, there are currently no superpowers. Now, you could argue if India is or not, but um, the, the rise of nations like Bangladesh and South Africa and um, you know, a range of others who are G20 members or near to that are, are going to be really important to us. Indonesia will become the fourth largest nation um, in economic strength by 2050. Bangladesh uh, is on a pathway, as we saw when we were there, um, towards being a developed nation. We can't ignore these things, Nigeria even, so the African nations will be rising too. So uh, we can't be complacent about the East, but I think we should be aware that the southern movement of the of the um, economic center is happening, and I think will happen more strongly after this event. So thank you, sir. Uh, may I ask uh, Shimuchu to kind of reflect on the theme about the interdependence uh, in the international uh, trade? Yes, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, so. I'm not sure uh, this is a direct direct answer to uh, you would like to uh, look for, but uh, uh, there is no clear definition, and it may be sometimes argued with the pros and cons. Uh, but there is the term uh, Asian values. For example, uh, Western values are referred as individual and freedom. Asian values. Uh, referred as uh, attributing to the entirety and coexistence. So I think uh, we can contribute to the development of uh, economy, society, and entire humanity by overlaying these values on business ethics. So then as digitalization advances, uh, one of the things that makes me worried about is so-called uh, etiquette, uh, etiquette of the people who use the internet. So I hope the idea of entirety and coexistence, Asian values, uh, will improve 
Internet Society and our society. Thank you. This is my comment. Thank you, sir, for your kind comments. And uh, may I have the uh, second question to Mr. Jamal uh, in Ajfil? That pre pandemic world was definitely an interdependent one, and which seems to be moving towards a different path. Possibly there is protectionism, trade war between the two big players are, you know, it's, it's a reality. If we consider the present challenge of pandemic also offers an opportunity, I mean, challenge is an opportunity, then what CSCCI can do in facilitating a meaningful mechanism for greater partnership in trade, investment, and technology transfer in post-COVID-19 scenario. May I invite Mr. Gugu to comment on this? Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, first of all, all panelists made good highlights. I will emphasize a few short issues. Uh, first of all, uh, when we look at this pandemic issue and its economic effects, I think we are going to a more serious new phase for both employees, businesses, and the countries. Most probably, we will see contraction in capacity utilization in all countries. This may mean more uh, trade protectionism or more uh, the price of all goods and services will rise most probably. Companies will need more, more working capital needs. Therefore, uh, I think uh, since this problem is global, the solution has to be global. We need a more strong global cooperation. Uh, like 2009 global crisis, the G20 mechanism needs to be more active. With a global cooperation mechanism, the green economy, environmental protection, and combating against climate change can gain speed. And uh, since this COVID-19 is likely to significantly impact working place design, uh, we all need guidelines to assist businesses to address the immediate need to create COVID-19 safe workplaces. In Turkey, our government has started working on safe workplace principles. This includes a number of checklists, including physical distancing, clinic and health hygiene and facilities, all of which will assist businesses to address the immediate need to create COVID-19 safe workplaces. So uh, I think we should uh, create more cooperation and share our experience and knowledge uh, to fight against this epidemic internationally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 I, I believe Mr. Jamal is ready. Is he? If you can. Uh, sorry for, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 I think uh, ECAS is a unique platform, and uh, since the world is uh, really changing and the business environment due to the, the COVID. Actually, this was a trend anyway, so probably the, 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 the COVID issue probably speeding up this process. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we have to adopt ourselves uh, to do the business uh, in these uh, new realities. But talking about the CASI, what CASI can do, and of course, uh, we have to <clears throat> also uh, try to adopt uh, uh, our organization to these new realities and uh, probably use uh, the CASI as a very good platform for the exchanging the ideas and experiences uh, among our members because the, we have the members from starting from the New Zealand, uh, which is uh, on the east, and uh, ending uh, with uh, Turkey and uh, the Russia, uh, which is uh, on the very, very west. Uh, so uh, this is a very big platform, a unique platform. And uh, uh, to have more and more 
uh, CASI has to become more online, let's say. So this, this is the future for of the business, and uh, uh, I think uh, we have to develop uh, the more online uh, platforms and programs for our members. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, the best way, of course, uh, to, to hear the, uh, our uh, the friends and colleagues from different countries, uh, member countries, and, uh, and exchange the ideas and uh, build a new way of communication among the members of the CASI. Yes, I mean, uh, since the partnership is crucial in helping Asia-Pacific SMEs to navigate COVID-19, so could you please share your thoughts on creating a meaningful business partnership to the region to help SMEs in particular? Yes. So uh, I think uh, sharing success stories uh, will be beneficial to uh, MSMEs. So as an, as an example, uh, the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, ICC, is uh, operating the Corporate Startup Start Award uh, in collaboration with the European Commission and other entities. So the award uh, selects large companies that startups value for working together. There is also a category called uh, Asia Cooperative Startup Start Award, uh, which is given to the company with the highest evaluation in Asia. So uh, it uh, already, uh, Kasi, I'm not sure uh, Kasi already involved in the uh, awards, but uh, it may be some difference or hint for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind comments. Uh, let, let us proceed to the uh, segment. So uh, uh, we will welcome the questions from the audience. So I, I got a question from uh, Mr. Uh, A.P. Singh from Belogic India, a freight forwarding company. He said uh, uh, he asked uh, that the supply chain have been upended. Please advise us, advise us how to make them more resilient. So who would like to reflect on that? Can, can, you, can we repeat the question, please? Question is, the supply chain have been upended. Please advise us how to make them more resilient. <sighs> It's, uh, yeah, you're right. So I'm, I'm from the business, uh, related business. So we are, we are representing uh, the one of the largest container shipping line in Georgia. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> we probably one of the first who saw the, the, the uh, decline in the volumes uh, and uh, the uh, reaction of the, the, the economy to this, uh, the problem. So, uh, the logistic is a part of the, the, and the supply chain is a part of the, the big industry, actually. So we are playing the, our uh, very important role in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the trade. So, and of course, uh, uh, our business is very much depends on the, 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 the how economy will, will continue. Uh, uh, <clears throat> this is a question for myself as well. So, because, uh, what has to be done? So, but uh, in our case, uh, no, we, uh, there is not not too many uh, can be done from our uh, side because, uh, as I mentioned, so we are depend on the uh, the uh, suppliers. We are uh, depend on the on the market situation strongly. So uh, we we need the economy to start uh, picking up again. So this is only the way how to uh, how to uh, start uh, uh, growing our business. The, the problem is, uh, in general now, so how to survive probably during this very difficult time. You know? So how to survive and not to, uh, <clears throat> how to survive the business, how to survive the professionals, uh, I mean the empl employments, uh, how to keep the people, you know. So this is, this is the challenges which we are Face today in our uh, organization as well. So we didn't uh, uh, reach the bottom yet, uh, and hopefully uh, it will not happen. But 
because in our scenario, uh, in my case, I can use the my case because we are not only serving the Georgia but also neighboring countries. So Georgia is a transit country. And uh, of course, uh, we are also depend very much on the situation in our neighboring countries. But uh, as I said, the volumes went down by 50%. And uh, it means that for us is now uh, we are not thinking about making the profit. For us is uh, now is a problem how to not make a losses, you know. So at least for uh, several months, and then uh, we believe and we hope that slowly economy will start at least uh, slowly, very very slowly picking up uh, because uh, uh, <clears throat> I mean uh, the world cannot continue like this. Uh, the solutions uh, everyone is thinking for, for the solution and. Uh, uh, some 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 of us will be successful in this, and some of, unfortunately, maybe not. So this is my answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have another question from Abhijit, Mr. Abhijit uh, SSP Limited India. Uh, he asked, uh, what are the scopes for dairy and food processing and waste management treatment sector? And another question from Deepak Agarwal. Uh, he is asking, uh, since pandemic has severely impacted the worldwide ecosystem and economy, kindly guide on marketing intelligence and global financial stability, uh, reliability. So, uh, Mr. Chinoy, would you help me that who should uh, have comments on these questions? I can I can um, Brian Clark here offer a little bit on on um, dairy and food supply chains, um, and of course uh, everyone continues to need to eat and to eat healthily and well. What will be a problem is if we see nations reverting to the self sufficiency argument and suggesting that they need to be completely self sufficient. That will be very detrimental to trade. Um, uh, in its totality. And so we need to resist such calls. And even if there are nations uh, who, and Australia does, you know, has, um, buy local campaigns, which are also worthy, is um, they need to be tempered and not made compulsory so that um, the, the proper exchange of goods from its uh, best comparative suppliers um, can be done and so that the economies can all work effectively and efficiently and supply um, the things which they are most able to supply um, to the rest of the world at the most efficient prices. So we need the world to retain the idea of comparative advantage and to embrace uh, um, even more strongly uh, the free trade ethics uh, which were in place before the pandemic came along. Uh, we don't want to see anything um, where uh, communities and beggar thy neighbour uh, policies are adopted and, and widespread for any length of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to add a little bit, uh, Ambassador, please, please. Uh, to uh, please, what uh, Brian mentioned. I, I fully agree uh, with him uh, because it's a bit disappointing to see that uh, globally uh, there is a shift towards uh, inward looking economic policies back again, uh, understandably as an immediate reaction to the crisis, uh, countries had to ensure that their basic needs are met uh, within their geographical boundaries and there were uh, limitations with regard to travel and with regard to port operations. Uh, so as an immediate response to the crisis, yes, that is uh, inevitable. But uh, I, I would very much urge uh, everyone to start again uh, looking at uh, the opportunities uh, presented by international trade and, and, and not to sort of uh, embrace the uh, immediate actions that we had to take uh, to manage the crisis. Uh, but as we come out of the COVID uh, uh, crisis, as we go into a recovery mode, uh, to start again uh, trying to see how we can uh, promote more trade uh, between countries, but maybe we might have to start adapting slightly different uh, strategies uh, because of the current uh, uh, conditions. So say, for example, I mean, we, we used to have a lot of trade fairs. Uh, we used to take delegations from one country to another uh, to promote business. Uh, 
some of those things may be for uh, some time to come. We may not be able to continue doing the same way that we did in the pre-COVID era. Uh, so we might have to look at more the virtual space and try to see how we can create portals to promote matchmaking, uh, maybe even a virtual trade fair uh, where we can showcase uh, some of the products uh, that each of us can offer to our uh, friendly neighbors and then try and promote more trade, uh, particularly between Asian countries. I, I just saw that Asia accounts for just about 23%. Uh, the total trade among Asian countries uh, is just 23% of global trade and there's a lot of potential for that to grow as we come out of this uh, crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for, uh, I would like to give my uh, humble thanks and, uh, and a deep appreciation uh, to all the panelists uh, uh, and, and the audience uh, to kindly cooperate. And I believe this is a very stimulating uh, uh, discussion we have had today. And uh, now I would like to welcome uh, SG, uh, 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 Mr. Chinoy, I believe. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes. Can you uh, take the floor for the vote of thanks? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador, for uh, giving the uh, session. I think I think I'll just put on the, the speaker because there's some problem in. So, thank you, Ambassador, for moderating the session, and thank you all the panelists uh, for uh, participating. I'm sure that you will all agree that this is indeed a very enriching uh, session. Um, so on behalf of Cassie and Fiki, I would like to thank everyone present here for joining us for this event. Uh, sincere gratitude to Mr. Samir Modi, President Cassie, for leading us through the course of this program and for all of us uh, always guiding us for all Cassie endeavors and navigating us uh, uh, through these times. His very special address giving us an overview of the current uh, situation in Asia was very relevant. Let me also take this opportunity to thank all my fellow panelists across the Asia Pacific countries for sharing their deep insights on the impact of COVID on the economies and giving suggestions for industry. To uh, Secretary General Ernest Slim, uh, many thanks uh, to him and the CASI Secretariat for partnering with Piki uh, for this exclusive conference. Um, as uh, two of the panelists mentioned, I'm sure that this is just the first one to start with, and many more such meaning uh, interactions will follow. We can actually do sectoral uh, sectors, and in fact, uh, it'll be very interesting to share something on healthcare uh, across the region um, and share representations and solutions that all of us have actually thought about, including the standard operating procedures uh, mentioned by some of the panelists. And you know we are looking forward to the Australia New Zealand air bubble, as they call, to see how it can be replicated across the world. Because many of the Asian Pacific countries uh, depend on tourism as a means of uh, you know uh, economic activity, and therefore these sharing these will be very very useful. I hope everyone who participated today gained a good perspective on the issues and have given them a good food for thought uh, going forward. We have to bring business back again. We have to restart the economies. Uh, we have to ensure livelihoods are created and expanded while still saving lives. Ladies and gentlemen, I know these are very difficult times for each one of us across the globe. We need to stay strong and sail through these tough and unprecedented times. Cooperation amongst the chambers uh, in the Asia Pacific region could be a very strong pillar of this uh, support and help to sail through these tough and difficult times. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for all uh, of you for uh, participating and thank you once again, Ambassador, uh, you know, for moderating uh, this session and for all the uh, panelists and apologies for the, sh you know, sometimes the technical difficulties, but I'm sure as we have more of these, we will, uh, you know, become accustomed to it because I think none of us in this panel and the speakers was born into the internet and video conferencing age. We have all evolved into it. And as long as we continue doing this, we'll become much more efficient going forward. So wish you all a very safe health and take care. And I'm sure we'll meet again soon 
and look forward to that uh, meeting. So thank you all the participants, thank you all the panelists, and thank you moderator, and thank you Mr. Modi for uh, for sharing this. Thank you very much, and this brings us to the end of the uh, conference. Thanks to everybody. Stay well and safe. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Stay well and safe. Thank you, sir.